I'll just give you a quick introduction about myself. Um, I've been working for the department for uh, just over 10 years now um, in various roles. Uh, I've worked for the fisheries division for a number of years um, doing trout surveys. I worked on the, the lake sturgeon project, um, tagging lake sturgeon um, in like 2014 to 2016. And then I transitioned over to the wildlife division um, in later in 2016 and that's when I took over the the uh, beaver baffle program for the department and I've been working with that ever since and then just over a year ago I got full-time continuing on with the beaver baffle program and also doing equip which is uh, NRCS uh, funded projects to help land private landowners with with habitat improvement on their property um, so let me share my screen here. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, all right, perfect. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about beavers, um, and beavers throughout Vermont and um, the, the many benefits that they provide to us, but also some of the challenges that they can create when they, they get into some certain situations. Before we start that, um, just wanted to touch on if people aren't familiar with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, uh, our mission here is to conserve um, the, the fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. That includes everyone. So most people know that we conserve um, like our white-tailed deer, our, our black bears, our trout, but we also manage for invertebrates, uh, our natural communities, um, plants, and then most importantly, the habitat, because without habitat, we're not going to have fish or wildlife. And we, we serve everyone. So that includes our hunters, our trappers, our anglers, but that also includes our wildlife watchers, our bird watchers, our communities, um, our anglers, and our, most importantly to me, our future generations. We want to make sure that we are managing our wildlife populations so that we can have those sustainably for, for our future generations. And I don't know, it's jumping ahead on me every so often, so I apologize for that. Um, but our Beaver Baffle Project was started in 2000. Um, so it's been going on for 23 years now. And um, it was started because we were getting an increase in complaints or conflicts with beavers. Uh, we're gonna get into some of those conflicts in a little bit, um, but we recognize the, the real value and importance of having beavers on the landscape for, for all of the, the habitat that they create for a whole host of wildlife species, but for also the benefits of people. Um, so the Beaver Baffle Project is a project that I run. I run statewide with it and I meet on site with landowners, towns, road crews, anyone who's having issues with beavers. Um, and I, when I do on site visits, I provide recommendations, trying to find, um, trying to resolve those conflicts where we can allow the beavers to continue about their business, have the wetlands, but resolve the, the conflict that they have. Um, and over the last five years, um, and this has really been true for my entire time here, um, I'm averaging around 400 calls and emails a year pertaining to just beavers. Um, of those 400 calls, usually make around 50 site visits, again, statewide. And then from those 50 site visits, I'm doing right around 15 installations, again, throughout the state. Um, some of our funding for the project comes from a US Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Wildlife grant that helps pay for my time to do the site visits and install the structures. Uh, the Vermont Duck Stamp Fund gives us money for the materials to build the devices. And then we also use uh, Pittman Robertson um, Act funding money as well. So the, the range of phone calls and emails I get regarding beavers is, is very broad. Um, it spans from anything from someone just seeing a beaver swim through their backyard pond and have questions about it to um, beavers chewing trees, which is a pretty common 
uh, conflict call that I get. And depending on how many trees the landowner is trying to protect, it can be a relatively easy thing to resolve. Um, beavers plugging, plugging culverts is another very common call that I get. Um, culverts are just a calling card for beavers to come and plug because essentially the road is the dam and the culvert is just a hole in that dam that they need to plug. So they're pretty smart. Rather than building a hundred foot dam, they're just going to plug a, a three foot culvert. So they're pretty smart animals when it comes to that. Um, again, some of the other common calls are beavers flooding roads or threatening roadways or beavers building dams that are threatening public or private property. So we have a number of different tools and techniques that we can use to try to resolve some of these conflicts. The first tool that I have at my disposal is called beaver baffles. They also refer to um, beaver deceivers or water control structures. Um, they all function relatively the same way. Um, the one on the left-hand side, I call a rectangle baffle. Um, it's made out of metal lobster trap caging material. Um, it's a PVC coated wire mesh. Um, I build it to about five feet in length and then the panels are two feet tall. Um, so it's two feet by two feet by five feet. Um, the one on the right hand side is just a round baffle that we can also use. I honestly haven't been using the round baffles quite as much in the last couple of years just because the way they are built is the panel that I use gets folded up into a circle and just that constant pressure on those bands over time, depending on the water chemistry, um, those welds can bust open and it doesn't always hold up as long as I would like it to. Um, so instead of the, the round baffles, I've been building like a square baffle similar to the rectangle baffle, um, just a little bit bigger. Um, the advantage to the, the rectangle baffle is it's a little smaller, a little more discreet, so I can tuck it into tighter, tighter areas where there may be more trees in the water, um, shallower water I can fit it into, where the round baffle or the square baffle is something I'm going to use when we have a more open space, the water's deeper, or if I need to use multiple pipes to move more water. So the way the baffle works is the idea is that we're having water enter this pipe, flow through the pipe, down below the the dam, maintaining that water level in the, the beaver pond at a lower height. So we're resolving the conflict, but it's doing so in a way that the beavers don't know that water is leaving the impoundment or they're not knowing how to figure it out. So the way it works is that the cage part of it gets dragged out at a bare minimum 30 feet, really 40, 50, even 60 feet away from the dam, upstream from the dam. Um, it's going to be better because if it's too close to the dam, when the beavers are repairing it or maintaining the dam, they're diving down, grabbing armfuls of mud and pushing it up onto the dam. So if it's too close, they're just gonna incorporate that cage part of the baffle right into the dam and they'll bury it. Um, and I know, cause I've done it from experience. <laughs> um, so again, that the cage is brought out away from the dam. It gets sunk, set onto the bottom underwater Water enters the, the pipe through all those holes that are drilled into it, enters, flows through the pipe, and then it flows through, or the pipe goes through a notch that we carve in the dam. And that the depth of the notch in the dam is ultimately gonna be what sets the height in the, the pond. Um, it's really important to know though, with these baffle systems, that the water's still gonna fluctuate depending on how much water we're getting um, throughout the year. So if it's really dry in the summer, the water will probably drop below the pipe. Whereas if we get a couple, couple weeks of heavy rain, the water is going to be high. Um, that's natural. That's nothing a baffle is going to be able to, to maintain. It's not going to be able to maintain a constant water height throughout the year. There is still going to be some flux, um, fluctuations in the water level. So the landowner needs to be understand that and be um, willing to compromise with that. So if this plays, so after we install the baffle, Thank you. 
so what you're seeing here is this was the night after I installed the baffle here. And the beavers, the sticks that are crisscrossed and laid perpendicular to the dam are something I put there to help hold the pipe down. Uh, but the beavers come back that night, repair the hole that I dug in the dam, packing it around the pipe. Um, and they think they've stopped the flow of water. What they're doing here is they're actually hearing the water run through the pipe on the backside or below the dam. So they're dragging sticks up and over the dam, trying to stop that, that sound of the water. Um, one of the triggers for beavers building dams is, is the sound of, of running water, which is a, another reason why beavers really like to plug culverts. So again, after the installation, this is what it'll typically look like. It'll drop that water level down a foot, two feet, whatever we need to do um, for that particular situation. Um, so again, the water level is going to fluctuate depending on the time of year, depending on how much rain or lack of rain we're receiving at that time. Um, and there's a number of factors that determine the success or even if a baffle is warranted in a specific situation. Um, water volume is a big one. Our bigger rivers or bigger ponds, um, it can be really difficult for an eight inch pipe or a couple of 12 inch pipes to be able to maintain the water level at our desired height. Um, water depth is a big, a big one as well. We need that cage to be completely underwater and have at least a couple feet of wiggle room um, because if that cage gets too close to the surface of the water, the beavers will key in on it. They'll he hear, even feel um, that water getting sucked into the pipe or entering that pipe and they'll, they'll bury the cage. Um, and then again, site layout, beaver activity is another big one. Um, we'll get into it a little bit, but beaver activity, activity changes throughout the year. So just because they're in one spot this year doesn't mean they're gonna be in that same spot next year. So it's a constant evolving situation usually because um, you could put a baffle in one location, but the next year they may move just upstream and build another dam that's creating the same issue. So the other tool that I have or technique that I have to resolve some conflicts are um, exclusion fences. And these are gonna be built at the inlet of a culvert. And the idea is that that fence prevents the beavers from getting to the culvert and preferably they won't dam around the fence and they'll go just upstream or maybe further downstream um, and build the dam and kind of continue about their business. So there's a number of different ways you can build these fences. I, I buy um, goat feedlot panels from Tractor Supply. They come in a 16 foot length, they're four feet tall and they have um, four, squ four inch square mesh opening. Um, they make they make hog panels, which have like the graduated sizes from smaller to, to larger. Those larger sizes um, are actually big enough where beavers can, can squeeze through them. So that four inch is small enough to prevent beavers from getting in, but it's big enough to allow your smaller turtles, your fish, um, your amphibians to, to pass through. Uh, I typically try to build these in a like a triangle shape where the, the outer edges flare out away from the culvert, roughly a 45 degree angle. Again, it varies greatly with, with the site. Um, that usually dictates the size and the shape of the fence because you'll have big rocks, you'll logs, all sorts of things that are gonna determine how that, that fence is built. Um, but the photo on the left is kind of the ideal situation that I look for when I'm installing these fences, because the primary beaver activity is upstream from the culvert. You can see they have a their primary dam there. That's where their lodge is. And they were just traveling down to this culvert, plugging it really just to raise the water level up a little bit so they could get to some of the trees on the bank there. But in this situation, I fully expect this exclusion fence to work really well, again, because the primary beaver activity is up away from the culvert. And it's similar to the second photo. Again, the primary beaver habitat or activity is upstream from this culvert. But you can see from this photo right here, there's a ton of food right near the culvert. So they could potentially 
continue to come down and try to plug it. Um, and that's why I put a pipe through there and it's just a, a six inch PVC pipe. Um, so if the beavers do dam around the fence, the idea is that pipe will help limit how high they build on the fence because when it raises up to a certain point, water will start flowing through, through that pipe. Um, and then the, the photo on the right is just another example of a fence that I had to build it that shape just because of, of the site layout. So again, you can kind of mess around with the different shapes and sizes, but I do find that the triangle shape is best suited for, for preventing beavers from plugging or damming around the culvert. And again, similar to baffles, fences don't work in all situations. Uh, this site here, I spent the better part of a day with VTrans um, building a fence at a fairly large culvert. And I try to shy away from larger culverts because the larger the culvert means more water is flowing through it. Um, and it can be difficult to, to, to build a fence that's going to withstand high water, high flow events. Um, but in this particular situation, we built that fence. But what happened was the beavers went downstream, downstream from the culvert and built a dam, backed the water up through the culvert, and then they were able to swim right through over the fence. And then they eventually started plugging the culvert. Um, again, in this situation, the beaver population was really high in this, this specific spot. Um, so it made it really difficult to, to have something like, like this work. Um, but again, water volume, water depth, the substrate, site layout, beaver activity are all factors that can determine how successful these devices are. So looking kind of at how many devices we've installed throughout the state, um, Otter Creek and the Winooski um, are our two biggest watersheds in Vermont. They also have kind of our highest density, density of the human population and beavers as well. So it kind of makes sense that those are the two kind of hot spots in Vermont. Um, and since the program started in 2000, we've installed over uh, 330 devices throughout the state. Um, and that's been impacting or influencing over 3,600 beaver created wetland habitat acres, which is really cool um, that we've had that such of an impact throughout the state. Um, and looking more specifically for your part of the Vermont and the Northern Champlain watershed and the Missisquoi, um, we've installed 23 devices since the, the project started. Um, and again, you have Franklin County, it's a little more rural. I think a lot of people kind of resolve the conflicts they have on their own. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the takeaway I get is the, the more rural the locations, um, people tend to to resolve conflicts on their own. Whereas if it's a little more suburban or urban, they're, they're calling me for help or calling um, Skip Lyle, who has Beaver Deceivers, um, who is another resource in Vermont that does very similar work to myself. So now we're gonna kind of transition away from um, beaver baffles into beaver created wetland habitat. Um, we've been talking about it a little bit, but why are beaver dams so important? Why are we? Why do we have a beaver baffle project that spends money to try to coexist with beavers? And the reason is because these wetlands are really important, um, again, for fish, wildlife, plants, but for people as well. When a beaver comes in and, and builds a dam or a series of dams, it's flowing the flow of water. So that flood energy is gonna be dissipated. It's allowing sediments to settle out and it's retaining sediments higher up in the watershed, allowing them to, to be filtered out. It's cleaning the water. Um, and the, these wetlands really start the, the start of the, the basis of the food web. So it's increasing the productivity of the water. Um, you're getting your phytoplankton that are um, using the inorganics to make food. And then you get your macroinvertebrates that are feeding on that, and your fish that are feeding on like the nymphs and the macroinvertebrates. Then you have your kingfishers and your herons that are feeding on the fish and the amphibians that are in there. Um, you have mink, river otter. It's really starting the whole basis of, of the food web. 
and and again, the, these dams are slowing the flow of water, so they're also preventing or reducing the effects of drought, and as well as um, uh, mitigating any large flow events that could be going on downstream um, during heavy rain events. They're capturing that water, they're holding it back, allowing that flood energy to dissipate. So this is kind of a really good example of that. Um, this was a, a photo, a drone photo taken from a landowner that I visited. Um, and it, it's a beaver dam kind of on the edge of a pasture or a field that get mo gets mowed um, a couple times a year. And you have two mainstream channels that merge into one. And you can kind of see the historic stream channels, which is the blue line. And then you have a number of beaver dams through here. So the, the longest red line is the, the primary beaver dam. And um, let's see if I can get a pointer to work here. Let me take a drink of water for one second. So you have the primary beaver dam, which is this long red line. And then you actually have the beaver lodge, which is right here. And then you have what I call secondary beaver dams down here. And those are just, again, increasing or raising the water level up, allowing beavers to get better access to the food. But what these beaver dams are doing is it's, again, slowing the flow of water. You can see this light sediment here, which is going to be like sand and silt. It is all getting captured by this beaver dam. It's allowing that water, the water to, to expand over a greater area. Whereas you look below the beaver dam, you have a gravel deposit here. You have some erosion on this bank. Um, so it's slowing the flow of water. Um, and most importantly, it's reconnecting this stream channel with the floodplain. So it's allowing this water to get out into here. Um, and it's adding stream complexity to this whole system. So you have water that's seeping down through here. You have another stream channel that's forming through here as well as here. So it's all really important stuff um, for our fish and again, for people as people like us. So who benefits from beaver created wetlands? Touched on it a little bit, um, but wildlife obviously benefits. So your mink, your trout, wood ducks, moose, muskrats, river otter, heron, um, there's a lot of wildlife that in some stage of their life cycle will use or utilize beaver created wetland habitat. Um, there's been studies done that have documented over 90 species of songbirds that have been found in a single beaver flowage, which is just in incredible. And there was a study done up in Maine that was looking at otter occupancy. So what type of habitat were otters most likely found in? And the number one variable or habitat type that they were found in was beaver created wetland habitat, active beaver flowages. And the number two variable was inactive beaver flowages. So this is a video that I took of a trail camera um, that I had set up over a beaver baffle installed up in Hyde Park, I believe. It's just a nice cow moose cooling off in the water. Again, you can see the, the pipe of the baffle going through the dam and being anchored down by the sticks there. So like I said earlier, we benefit from, from beaver created wetlands as well. They're an incredible place to go and view wildlife. If you like birding, the best place to go in the springtime, early summer, even throughout the summer, is an active or even an inactive beaver flood. You'll be amazed at the number of birds that you'll see there. Um, and these beaver created wetlands also create really good fishing, hunting, and trapping places as well. Some of the best brook trout fishing in Vermont is associated with beaver created wetland habitat. So we talk a lot about active beaver habitat is being really important. 
but I actually view abandoned or inactive flowages just as important as, as those active ones. Um, so when a beaver moves into a location, they'll build a, a dam, a series of dams, they'll flood the area, and then they'll, they'll live there until they deplete that food source that they have. Um, and beavers really like maples, willows, alders, um, poplar, aspen, and a lot of the riparian tree species that you find along the rivers and streams. Um, so when they deplete that, that food source, they're gonna be forced to move on and they'll move on further upstream or downstream. Um, and then shortly after they leave, when the beavers are no longer maintaining those dams, they're gonna hold back less and less water. And then over time, that, that flowage is gonna dewater and all of that sediment that was underwater is incredibly rich with nutrients. And when it's exposed to, to the air, it can green up fairly quickly. Um, and this is really important habitat as well. Um, the species that utilize it may shift slightly, um, but in the springtime, black bears, this is one of the first places that bears will go to in the spring because um, it's one of the first places that has green grass. And in the springtime, there's usually not too much food for them out there. Um, later on in the year, you'll have deer going to these areas, especially when they get a little thicker in vegetation, because it's a great place to, to hide a fawn. Um, and then you also, with that, the predators know like that, like your bobcats and your coyotes. So they'll go there to, to hunt as well. So to wrap up, um, if you are interested, there's a number of ways you can help support Habitat in Vermont. Um, there's different things you can donate to, but you actually don't even have to donate to make a difference. There's a lot you can do um, right on your own property to make improvements to your habitat um, or to make improvements for, for wildlife. That can include putting out bird boxes, um, create or planting pollinator habitat, um, things like that. And we're also, there's plenty of opportunities for people who are interested to volunteer. There's plenty of organizations that are looking for volunteers, whether it's to, to do like a green up day, to plant trees, prune apple trees. Um, there's plenty of opportunities to make a real difference for, for wildlife in Vermont. So with that, that wraps it up. My contact information is here. Um, so if anybody has um, any issues with beavers that they're, they're looking for um, help with, you can, you can contact me anytime. Uh, we just got about close to two feet of snow down where I'm at, so we're still pretty buried in snow. <laughs> um, I typically like things to be snow free, I guess you could say. Um, it makes it easier to kind of evaluate sites when you're not trudging through snow and things are frozen over, but I think spring is just around the corner. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, we'll now open it up for Q&A. If anyone has any questions for Tyler, if you want to type in the chat, um, feel free and I'll read them out. Or if you just want to talk, go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing. I can share my information too with yeah. Sarah. And I, and I will Hansen also too. be sending out an email after um, this with the recording and also his contact information for anyone that okay. is interested in contacting him. All right, perfect. I have a question, Tyler. Uh, this is Jake Kucha from Westfield. And when you when you make the uh, the pipe, uh, you know that comes out, the pictures seem to show the pipe as being heading down into the water. Do you get any kind of uh, airlock issues with that? Are you referring to the like the beaver baffle? Yes. Part? Yeah. Um, no. So. Um, so the inlet of the pipe will be stuck inside the cage and when i'm using the rectangle baffle it's attached to a larger pipe that has a bunch of holes drilled into it um so when i install it that cage gets dropped into the water first and then i'll actually usually poke holes or drill like a slice along the top of the pipe that runs from the cage downstream and that allows the air to to kind of es escape the pipe um, and then also take cinder blocks to weight the pipe down and push any air that's in that pipe out so the water can flow through. Yeah, so the, the way I could see the pictures, it almost looks like the water has to go uphill a little bit to go over the over. Maybe the pictures uh, didn't really reflect reality. 
Yeah, so the way it works is that um, that pipe is going to be resting on the bottom of the pond, and then it'll run up and over or over or through the dam and then down the backside. But it's never yeah. going up and out of the water. So the, the height of the pipe will ultimately set the water height. So if the okay. pipe is higher than the water level, no water is going to flow through. Where if it's a foot below the water level at the height of the dam, then it could potentially drop a foot. Yep. So okay. Makes Thanks. Sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tyler. Okay. I have a question about um, what what uh, the other three hundred and fifty calls you get end up doing. Is it just an easy resolution, or it just doesn't require a site visit? Yeah. Um, a lot of the calls I can answer over the, the phone. Um, so it may just be like if, if beavers are chewing trees, for example, that's not something I need to, to go out and see. Um, I can provide recommendations right over the phone. Um, so with something like that, um, what you can do fencing around the tree to prevent the beaver from getting to it. There's also a, a, a recipe for mixing latex paint with uh, masonry sand. Um, and that mixture, you paint the base of the tree and it's really abrasive. So the beavers will, will chew on it a little bit, take a couple of bites out, but it wears on their teeth very quickly. So they actually will leave it alone. Um, we've had pretty good success with that. It needs to be re reapplied as the tree grows every couple of years, um, but it can work pretty well. Um, and then some of the other calls are just, um, seeing having a beaver in like their backyard pond. Um, that's not something we typically deal with because the funding for our project is to influence beaver created wetland habitat. So if it's a man-made pond or like a naturally occurring pond, um, we're not really getting anything in return by, by doing a site visit there or installing a baffle. We're not maintaining any beaver created habitat in those situations. If that's something people are interested in pursuing, do you point them towards a contractor or a? Yeah, if somebody want, if somebody had um, like a backyard pond that was an acre or any size that they had beavers in, and they were interested in keeping the beavers there, but they obviously didn't want it flooded, that's when I would refer him to like Skip Lyle of Beaver Deceivers. He would be a good contact for to help out with something like that. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question, um, Tyler. We have a uh, a beaver started a dam next to a stream on our land, which is uh, in a field that's that's hayed, and I we I can't really tell if the beaver is still there. If the beaver is there's a lodge and there's a dam and there are clearly trees chewed around, but I don't see any recent. Um, activity if if there was a beaver staying there would it would we see you know activity yeah is it frozen over right now or is it open water it's open water some is open water yeah okay um yeah if it was open water um you would probably notice activity especially if there's snow on the ground you can kind of see where they crawl out onto the shore right. and cut mm -hmm. trees um if it was completely frozen over, it can be a little more difficult to tell if it's active. Um, mm -hmm. But usually you're looking for like a food cache. So that's going to be a pile of branches that are stuck in the water. Um, another really cool way to tell if a beaver lodge is active in the wintertime when you have snow over it, mm -hmm. um, if it's safe to do so, because the ice around beaver lodges can be thin at, at places. Um, but if you climb up on top of the beaver lodge, if it's active with beavers, there's going to be like a vent hole. So it'll, oh. it'll be an area where there's melted snow at the top. Um, I see. Just a cool way to tell if a beaver lodge right. is active in the wintertime. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, looks like we have a question in the chat. Um, huh? did, did the beavers ever chew holes in the pipes or of the beaver baffles? Yeah, um, so we typically use like an eight inch pipe or a 12 inch pipe. And the thickness of them varies actually between the eight inch and 12 inch. The 12 inch is pretty thick. 
Um, but the eight inch pipe is fairly thin. So I've had, I've only had it a couple of times where beavers will actually chew through it. Um, most of the time, it's just a couple of bites where they put a couple of small holes into it and it's no big deal. Um, but there was one particular situation where the beavers actually chewed a pretty substantial hole in the pipe and then somehow were able to, to plug it. Um, so I actually went back and uh, wrapped the pipe in chicken wire and that seemed to work. Um, but for the most part, they, they don't chew through the pipe, which is good for me. <laughs> Any other questions? You guys are letting me off easy tonight. Tyler, I'm curious if you have a sense of, um, I guess, how many folks, like you were saying, take care of the problem on their own versus actually reach out to try to find a way to coexist with the beavers? Yeah, um, I don't really. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to just because we don't feel the calls like or if we don't hear about it. We don't know about it um, in the, the 400 calls that I are or 400 calls and emails that come to me are specifically coming to me. That doesn't even count like all the calls that are game wardens or other biologists are are getting related to beavers. Um, right. so most of them will get passed along to me if it's like a site where I can look at and provide recommendations, but not not all of them do. Um, so yeah, it's hard to tell if, if they don't come to me, I don't, I don't hear about them. Yeah. <laughs> Not surprising. It's just, yeah. I'm, I'm impressed that you get 400 inquiries. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. I think that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, oh, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, yeah. I'm curious. Um, I, I live in Richford and I was reading some of the select board minutes and I'm not sure what month they were from, but it was within the past few months. And they are talking about a beaver problem on our road, which is Gilmet Road in Richford. I was wondering if, if Richford has reached out to you about what to do about their beaver problem. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about that specific site, um, but I have met with the town of Richford in the past um, regarding another issue. and. I, I can't recall the name of the, the road. <laughs> I, okay. I go to so many sites throughout the right. year. Um, but yeah, I the town of So Richmond they know has, you exist and yeah. to reach out to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and we I try was, to do. Um, I was just wondering whether I need to go down to the town and say, you need to contact Tyler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can feel free to do that. Um, we have done like training sessions in the past with both VTrans and um, town highway or town road mm. crews. Um, trying to get our name out there to, for me to to have them reach out to me anytime they're having issues. Um, again, we may not be able to resolve it with an exclusion fence or beaver baffle all the time, but it's definitely a good option to at least look into, um, mm. especially if it's like a, a reoccurring issue that seems to be happening every year, every couple of years. Mm. Sarah, if I can jump in. Yes, Tyler, you go to too many site visits to remember which ones, but I was at a, the site visit on Gilnut Road in Richford and, and you were there and people were, it was talking about the dam removal, but there were a lot of discussion about beavers. And okay. I heard some of the things that you mentioned tonight during that site visit, but the question does prompt something that I was thinking about. I live in a, a town I won't name in, in Chittenden County where there was a, an issue with beavers and the town highway department took care of it and people were not particularly pleased with with how that was done and some of those cases where these issues are not coming to your attention i think maybe um like the one that was here um so i'm just curious is there and maybe you said this and i missed it i was going back and forth early um is there any special or particular outreach to town highway departments to make them aware of what services you can provide, not that you're looking for more work? Yeah, um, we've done like training sessions um, with Vermont Local Roads, which is um, like a part of VTrans, but they work with like town towns. Um, so I've done a number of different training sessions for specifically geared toward town road crews um, to provide them with information um, 
so they're kind of better equipped with to deal with these situations when they come up. Well, thanks, Tyler. I think yeah. we put up, but we appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, we've been having a, a really interesting winter so far with our online seminar series that Sarah set up. So thank you for being one of those speakers. Uh, it's been fun to have these variety of topics, and I've certainly learned a lot tonight. I've I've heard the term beaver baffle a number of times, but I hadn't seen the visual. And that is an impressive structure. So yeah. thank you for what you do to, to keep harmony and reduce conflict. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity and I'm always happy to, happy to chat and help happy to help out whenever I can. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to um, steal back or have the screen sharing. I'm going to share my screen just to show um, uh, our upcoming events. We have uh, switching to a different animal. We have amphibian road crossing, another online event with um, teacher naturalist from North Branch Nature Center will be teaching us about our local amphibians. This is next Tuesday at 7 p.m. So I hope folks will join us for that as well. Um, if you haven't registered already to get that Zoom link, it's available on our website. And um, Pete did this training with us last year and they're very knowledgeable. It was a wonderful thing. And we will follow up and do some amphibian road crossing salamander night patrols um, when the weather turns. And then our next, and oops, sorry, wrong direction. Our next speaker series will be uh, at our April meeting on April 20th. And we'll be learning about the um, geology of the cold hollow mountains. Wow. Upcoming events. And thank you everybody who joined us tonight. You're welcome to stay for our business meeting. Uh, we're always happy to have visitors and people who are interested in learning about what we do. Um, but also feel free to step off if you uh, just came for the beavers. That's acceptable, too. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. I'm going to hop off. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot.